Today, we have a panel of presenters who come to us from Oklahoma. Oklahoma State University, is that right, Chantel? She's, I hope she's nodding. But so Ms. Uh, Chantel uh, is a prevention coordinator in the Center for Family Resilience at Oklahoma State University. In addition, we have some folks from Cornell University, Dr. June Mead, who's a program leader at, uh, at the state level at Cornell University Cooperative Extension. Uh, her colleague, Kelly Maybe, who is a 4-H Unity Community Project Coordinator, also for Cornell University Cooperative Extension, but out of Broome County. And later we'll be uh, introducing uh, an, an additional member of their team, Ms. Briatti, who is a 4-H Unity Teen Leader. So hopefully I got all that right. And those are our brief introductions. We will be, um, there are a couple of things that you need to know. First of all, uh, we have a uh, live transcript is running so that we can transcribe this uh, for other folks. If it's bothering you down in the lower uh, bar, you can ask to have that quieted. Or if it's not and you need to see it, please uh, feel free to add that uh, to your screen. In addition, uh, we will be taking questions at the end uh, and that, uh, so feel free to put them into the chat box. I'll be monitoring it during, uh, during the presentation, but I'm also a one man show today. So that means I'm running the video, I'm running the slides and I'm also keeping June grounded. So today, you, Mark. you're more than welcome June. Today, we're gonna start with Ms. Chantel, if that's all right. And I'll get her slides up and on the spotlight some folks. Uh, and again, we will be taking questions at the end. So please uh, put them in the chat box if you can't hold them and we'll talk to you all in a little bit. Oh, I'm doing it as fast as I can, I swear. You're fine, thank you, Mark, for being the one man on this. We know what that's like sometime in the virtual world. Yeah. All right, everyone. So I am coming to you from Oklahoma State University in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where we do our programming um, as United We Can, Unidos Se Puede. Um, and we're gonna be talking about how we connected with our students and families in this, this past year and some, some very valuable lessons learned. So connecting in the virtual world. Next slide, please. All right, so this is basically um, our, our programming this past year, but before I get into that, typically we work within the schools um, during the school hours with our students with one-on-one -on -one success coaching. Um, we also typically have family nights in the evening, sometimes five weeks in a row, and then we do booster sessions monthly. So our program consists of success coaching one-on-one -on -one with the students um, and, in the schools and also um, making sure that we're engaging with our families after school in the evening times. And so of course, when the school was shut down, we had no access to the students in person, which we found ourselves in a, in a great deal of um, finding, trying to scramble, trying to figure out how to connect with them, as I'm sure most of you have. And so they went to distance learning as, as everyone knows. And so we were trying to figure out how we were gonna do distance programming. So in March, April, around this time, we are usually getting prepared to end our academic year and move on to our summer programming. And so um, with that, we did find ways to engage with students online. We came up with online clubs. Uh, we found virtual job shadow, which personally, I, I, I like that. And we're going to use that um, in our programming here on. But that was a way we were uh, at least part of the programming that I initiated was field trips during the academic year. But this was a way to pivot and do some field trips with that as well. But as we get into May and July for our summer programming, we came up with some, some clubs. Um, some of them consisted of um, physical activity where we created lessons and had the students engage with that. Um, we wanted, we encouraged typing because you know that they were doing lessons online. So we found some typing, online typing skills for them to work on. I'm trying to think of everything. Gaming was one of them. Of course, that was one of the most popular ones. So again, school, they're starting um, distance learning in March, April. We go into our summer program. So we pretty much had some kind of more, we had more engagement early on. I'm going to say that. And we're going to talk about some pitfalls along the way. Um, and then we get into August, we're still in distance programming. And so we're starting now to assist the schools with as they're helping students. They came, the school system here came up with some um, ways for students to come to the schools at least once a week. 
um, or a little bit more throughout the week for um, learning and technology assistance. So we put ourselves in that place to be able to assist students, at least to show our faces there. Um, that's how we stay connected with some students too. Phone calls did not always work when we were trying to do our programming. They wouldn't answer their phones or we mostly had parents' numbers. Um, doing Zoom calls did not always work because what they, they didn't really engage much in Zoom. And then at this point in August when school starts again, they are pretty much in the fall, I'm gonna say August to December, it zoomed out at this point. So we started thinking of other ways how we can engage. So January, we started online tutoring because we knew that our students needed assistance with tutoring. And so we did get some students from the university to help and be available for online tutoring. We had a few students show up for that, um, but honestly that, you know, across the board, we, we didn't have a lot of engagement with that one either. And we did try to work it around schedules when they would not be in school because there was one day when they did not attend online learning and we also had it available in the evening time. At this point, we're, we're assuming that there's Zoom fatigue already. We did offer parent tech help. That was one of our first um, outreach programs to assist parents during this time. And so we wanted to teach them on how to help their kids better understand the, their Chromebooks and working and navigating distance learning. Um, we partnered with some schools uh, with this one as well, but we also held a parent tech week at our, at our site, which we did have some involvement with that. We found that parents are very well much frustrated, not understanding a lot of things, and we did our best to help them because we didn't under, fully understand what the different systems in the schools, but we figured it out together with the parents. And so that was one um, attempt at making sure that we stay connected with the families on a larger scale as well. Still moving in, um, we started thinking about how we're gonna implement our, our family sessions. Again, we, we normally meet personally, but um, I will say in between, in, in between times, we did have some family fun engagement nights via Zoom. Um, I think that started probably back in, I must take a step back in, in the summertime. And what we did with that was we came up with some, some fun games, like a scavenger hunt, things you could find in the house. We had someone on the team who was great with coming up with um, some giveaways, um, probably in getting donations as well. So um, coming up with fun I, uh, games for the family, we did encourage the parents to be there as well. Those were our most well-attended events when it was aimed at, at, at being fun. So keep that in mind when it's time to engage with families. The kids and the families, they weren't trying to tune in to Zoom, but when we say we were gonna play some games, they, they showed up for that. Um, and then as we continue on throughout the school year, kids are, are returning to in-person. And so I think building those relationships, even um, being at the school, um, creating fun events, those all helped when we were returning back to school because they returned back to school in March. So we stayed consistent and prominent in their minds because we were making uh, phone calls and reaching out to them and inviting them to events. Throughout this, I will say we had a few um, in-person events outside at, at parks that also helped with as we were returning back to school and planning for our summer academy, which we're now in. So this past May, we had a summer kickoff on May 22nd. Um, at this point, again, everybody is ready to get out of the house. And so um, we felt that that was a ses successful event as we're preparing for our summer. And currently we are in our, we're going, next week will be our third week of summer, in-person summer programming. And some of these students have seen our faces on the screen, even though they might not turn on their faces, but they have shown up and taken a step back to the family sessions, which we did in April, April through May we were able to, um, we started off with about eight families consistently, and then we, we ended up with one student who, who, who stayed the entire time. And I remember earlier in our, um, as we were going through these distance learnings, you know, we wouldn't have a lot of students show up at one, at one point, and we were like, okay, do we still meet or do we cancel? And at some point, you, you just realize you show up for that one. And so as the numbers decrease, we're still going to show up. And that one continued on. And she's still in our summer program. I think she's one of, she stands out as a, as a leader in our program. So even if any, nothing else, show up for the one. But even those, as you continue to try, uh, we did some home visits throughout as well um, to bring things to our students. We created um, kits. Part of our program is on entrepreneurship. And so we, um, 
we know that sometimes hygiene products are an issue, but we created ways where we can um, tie that into entrepreneurship where you do it yourself, um, lotion or deodorant. And so we made these kits and we took them to the home. So we would call, go out there. So those are ways to stay engaged. And if those are short visits, they don't have to be intense, but just something so that they can see your face because they do miss seeing us. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'm gonna talk about what didn't work. <laughs> Um, one on one success coaching via Zoom. Again, the students, they're not, they're not, they didn't want to show up for it. Um, and I think a lot of it was there, they had their own struggles with technology and learning distance as uh, distance learning as well. And then also connecting with students if they didn't have their own phone. So really it was so much easier when we were in person because we knew they were there. Um, and we had access to them, but that wasn't the case. And a lot of, uh, we're working with middle school students. And so they were helping their, their younger siblings with their distance learning as well. So it was just a lot of barriers in our way when it came to connecting with the, with the students. The schools did give them um, Chromebooks and access to the internet. But again, it, it was very difficult in, in reaching them um, for one of the major points of our, of our programming. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what worked? Um, students connected with their, um, when we did have them and they connected with their own phones, they would reach out sometimes to us and, and just ask, you know, like, when is the next event or what's going on? So they did want to be connected. Um, it's just, it was sometimes difficult for them to connect as well. Um, fun nights via Zoom, again, those were, the, in the beginning, very, very well attended. Um, but I think, again, Zoom fatigue set in. And so um, those kind of um, drifted up apart a little bit. Again, connecting with the home visits that did help. And then tagging along with the school events, there were some schools who they also did home visits as well. So we would tag along with them and seeing them connect us with the schools that helped us in, in, in some ways as well. So again, and that was building um, school partnerships and strengthening those relationships with the schools as well. Next slide, please. So moving forward, since we did have to pivot, we have some evergreen content for in-person or virtual learning when it came to our family workshops. We have, we have some videos that we set out uh, tailored towards growth mindset, um, forming positive habits. Um, and so we, we have those videos that we use with our family sessions. And, but we can also use those um, as, as we've talked about when in this upcoming fall is if parents um, are not able to attend those family sessions that we have in the evening, there's still a way for them to participate because we can upload this to our site. They can click on those, watch those videos and still participate. So we wanna make it available for every family and student to still have access to the content, even if they're not able to meet with us in person. We've also created a virtual toolbox for us as backup. I mentioned virtual job shadow that has allowed us to, um, tailor some of our content related to growth mindset and implement that in there and, and goal setting, um, smart goals, that goes in there as well. So we've developed a virtual toolbox when, if, we, if we end up in this predicament again, or just for additional resources, we have those resources available for us. Next slide, please. Oh, that was it. So um, really the main, the main takeaways for us were that, you know, we could, um, we're, we're, we know what works and what doesn't work. The virtual doesn't work for us. Our kids, they really want to be engaged in person because we, when we opened up, we had a family event for a movie night. That took no major recruitment at all. Um, and so we know what kind of language we want to use now moving forward too and how we want to adapt our program to better meet the needs of our families. Particularly, they want to they see more fun events. They want to be engaged in, a, in an um, in entertaining way, but we figured out a way to do that and also incorporate the content that we want them to under uh, that we want them to grow, such as growth mindset and forming habits. How do we put that into a fun um, and fun way for them to engage? So, um, and again, one of my main takeaways was just show up for the one. If that's who's showing up, show up for them. Thank you. Thank you, Chantel. Whoops. I was going to remind folks to put those questions in the chat box if they have some for Chantel while we get everybody switched over. I have a counterpart in the audience. She reminded me that 40 students showed up for our summer programming last week. Okay. 
Thanks, June. You should be ready. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is June Mead, and I'm representing our program, our SIFAR project in New York uh, called UNITY. UNITY is an acronym for Urban Neighborhoods Improved Through Youth. And uh, really that in a nutshell tells you what we're all about. Um, Kelly maybe is going to be joining me today. Kelly is uh, an absolute superstar representing our uh, program in the field. She brings a lot of experience, years and years and years. I'm not going to tell you how many, but if you've been around SIFAR for a while, you've probably had an opportunity to meet Kelly at one of the SIFAR conferences. Um, Kelly will be uh, talking about our Unity project that's in Broome County, in, operating in Endicott, uh, New York. And uh, joining us shortly will be Brie Ate. Uh, Brie is one of the young people in our project and we refer, refer to them as Unity Teen Leaders. Uh, next slide. What I really want to focus on is what we learned uh, during the pandemic about what works. Uh, and the first thing I have to say is we were tremendously success, su successful and lucky in that uh, we had already begun the program. We already had the first year under our belts and had developed relationships with the young people. They knew they could trust us. Uh, we had created wonderful partnerships with the, the sites where we were working uh, at the school and in the community with, uh, for example, this one slide here shows on the right hand side shows uh, some police officers. The uh, Endicott police have been a vital uh, partner with us. Uh, we were, we learned that uh, it was important throughout once the pandemic struck and we were forced to go online overnight, uh, it was still going to be important to continue to provide the supports and opportunities for the young people to carry out the projects that they themselves came up with. Our program is based on ensuring youth voice. We give the young people the voice to decide on the projects they want to carry out and then we provide the supports and opportunities that allow them to carry it out. And during the pandemic that has meant getting very creative about how we go about supporting those projects. Next slide please Mark. So ensuring youth voice and getting creative means, once again, finding support for their community action uh, projects. The youth community action model is based on the young people deciding on the projects and the adults acting as support. Uh, there's a continuum that begins with the adults having a lot of power and that trickling out where the youth take over and have the power because we believe and we've seen it happen over and over again uh, throughout the years that we've uh, been blessed to have SIFAR projects in New York. And quite honestly, it's been uh, over 25 years because we were one of the very first SIFAR projects in the nation uh, when uh, Cornell was chosen as one of the five uh, states to, uh, Cornell's not a state, obviously, excuse me, <laughs> but uh, New York was so selected as one of the five states to uh, have one of the pilot SIFAR projects. So we do have a lot of experience and we've brought that over and over again over the years uh, to improve, use our lessons learned and continue to refine what we do. And we've got a pretty strong model now. Um, Kelly will be coming back and talking about some of these projects to explain more about what's going on. But similar to what Chantel was talking about, our, 
our project also has a parent family connection. And one of the things that became critical uh, to engaging families during the pandemic, because uh, we struggle with the same kind of thing, no, no cell phones, no uh, bad internet connections, sometimes uh, no computers. And uh, fortunately, uh, our youth were also given Chromebooks through their school. But anyway, one of the things that was highly successful has been for the parent family act, uh, aspect is uh, we have these monthly family engagement nights and uh, they've been just absolutely wonderful and it's a joy to see. And through funding that I secured through another community grant, uh, we were able to provide the ingredients uh, for the various uh, dinners. Uh, the ingredients were purchased at the grocery store, bagged up, taken to the uh, each of the homes of the parents and families uh, who are going to be participating and they cooked along. And uh, it was a wonderful win-win situation for partnering with our extension educators. On the left-hand side of the page is a picture of them, of our educators uh, being filmed live for the cook-along. And the other thing that has been uh, really critical because we do, in addition to seeing uh, this at uh, our program as a youth development program, it's also very much a uh, opportunity uh, for workforce development, for young people to learn skills, become prepared uh, over the course of the, their time in the program to go on. We strongly encourage and have various mechanisms built into the program to encourage the young people to go on to college. We support them. We write letters of recommendation and uh, we've honestly been very, very lucky with 95% uh, of the youth who complete our project, which it involves at least a two-year commitment to being in unity. Uh, those 95% of the youth who complete the project uh, go on to college or have gone on to college with full or partial scholarships. And um, so these real world skills, the focus on uh, on uh, going on to college, the focus on developing uh, real world workforce readiness skills uh, has been really part of our focus. It's been successful and helped us because it attracts the kids to, oh, sorry, I shouldn't call them kids. I do that sometimes now that I'm getting so ancient. Next slide. You were supposed to laugh at that, Mark. I guess you must be on mute. I was June. I laughed. I was giggling. <laughs> Thank you. So at this point, I really want to turn it over to uh, Bree and to Kelly to talk about their projects. I, uh, Kelly, did you want to introduce the? There's Bree. Hi, Bree. Um, do you, who wants to introduce? Kelly, why don't you go ahead and introduce uh, the uh, video? Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here presenting about our 4-H Unity Endicott um, and lessons we learned um, along the way during this pandemic was that we very quickly had to pivot our program um, and stay relevant for the young people to continue to join us after school when they've been Zoomed out. Um, and very early on, uh, we decided and listened to the young people. They were concerned about other young people in their peer groups um, not staying home and taking the pandemic seriously. And this was really our opportunity to show our young people that we're he we hear you, we listen to you. Um, and in the meantime, the really exciting part about this public service announcement that was put together was that our Unity Endicott new grant uh, was able to partner with a CIFAR sustained grant in through the Binghamton City School District um, who employed our young people. And that was kind of that model of the workforce development 
program. Um, and so this was something they put together. They went out, they put their pieces together, they filmed it, they worked really closely together in order to bring it through all different courses of social media. And in our world, social media for young people was a really cool thing for them to be able to work on. So Mark, if you wanna show the public service announcement, PSA. Hi guys, Mr. Jake here. Hi, I'm Brianne Taylor. Hi, my name is Madison. Hi, my name is Aisha. I am Hi, my name is Brianna Ate, and this is my little sister, Didi. Hi. Hi, my name is Keisha, and I'm a part of Citizen U. Hi, my name is Joey, and I'm part of Unity. This is Kelly Stopper, and Hi, my name is Aisha. I am staying home to help doctors save lives and to help the world contain this coronavirus. I stay home to continue to protect me and my family and to make sure we all stay healthy during this time. It's because I want my life to go back to normal. I want to be able to do things like see my grandparents. We support each other because during this time it's very hard to keep a healthy mindset. So I can stay home in order to keep my sister sane. I'm staying home for my mom. If I get a cold, you know, I'm usually fine, but if she gets a cold, it really slows her down. I'm an essential worker and I social distance so I can keep my customers and my coworkers safe. I am staying home to prevent the spread of coronavirus. I stay home so that my life and my family's life can go back to normal as soon as possible. This is why I stay home. I'm a mom and a young working professional. I want to let you guys know that I am taking the time to social distance to really connect with the stuff that I love to do, like going for walks and hikes in this beautiful weather. Um, Why I've been home, I've been really busy working outside in my yard, doing a little gardening. Here's my garden I planted. Because I want to keep my friends and family safe. Just because I'm young and healthy doesn't mean I can't still carry the virus and give it to someone that I care about. Be smart and be safe. So thank you to all the first responders and all the people that are helping on the front lines for keeping people like me and my sister safe. Remember to keep washing your hands. Stay safe. Bye, everybody. Bye. Stay home. Stay safe. the curve. Thank you for staying home for us. Um, so that was just uh, the very first project of everybody coming together, meeting via Zoom, going out, take socially distanced safely, videoing their shots, different places around town um, with heroes work here, working with stakeholders like nurses, doctors, staff. And it was really a time where the young people said, I feel listened to, we helped, we provided supports, opportunities, and they were able to make it happen. Um, Really, we can't do it without our young people and they are our voice. We had a visiting professor just recently, they put together a project called Unity Feeds the Community. And they were really concerned because in our area, uh, the food pantries were going dry. Bree can also touch a little bit about this because she, um, her church is one where one of the pantries is um, held and they were really struggling with food, lack of food coming into the pantry after the holidays and especially during the pandemic. And so Unity heard the cause. We had a visiting professor from Chow um, to talk about the need. Um, and in our area, you normally this year in 2021, there's 300,000 pounds that in a normal year are donated to the food pantry. They're down to 50,000 pounds. And that was a really big cut. And again, our young people, he was so proud of them and said that it's not just about activism, it was about actionism. Um, and so these young people just kind of lead the way. They are the driving force. We are there to provide the supports, the opportunities. Um, and I can let Bree talk now about being a part of the program because I could go on and on and on. So welcome, Bree. Hi, everyone. Can, can you hear me? 
All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Bree. I'm 18 years old, and I'm proud to say that I've been a 4-H team leader for about two years now. And so being a part of such a diverse program like 4-H Unity has allowed me to become a lot more indulged in my community in many unique ways that I honestly would have never thought before. So honestly, by being able to speak freely about the things that I'm passionate about, such as like race relations and the prospect of reconciliation while also working with my peers of different backgrounds, I found that I have been able to develop a lot more um, empathy and compassion for those that I might not have been able to connect with um, in terms of you know the COVID-19 pandemic through unity. And so um, by having the opportunity to be part of such a diversified group, I can learn and listen to others and honestly just learn of how to be better civically engaged within my community and also just knowing that I can make a difference through all the little things that I do. And so um, being a part of Unity has helped me a lot, especially emotionally throughout the pandemic. Um, it was very hard for me personally because as someone who has, you know, been involved in so many things for, you know, so long through school and everything, it was hard to have all those things we put on hold. So Unity really helped me continue a lot of the projects that I had started before the pandemic really like took hold on our lives. And um, one thing that I really loved doing through Unity was the website that we created in order to um, uh, that were struggling during the pandemic and also just making sure that people who might not have had um, any struggle any struggles before the pandemic who now currently have to you know use resources within their community within our community to you know get back on their feet um, we wanted to make sure that they knew where these opportunities and services were so we created a website called unityendicott.org where we put down um, these like listings of like um, community resources such as where to go to a local food pantry if you're in need of services, how to um, call 211 if you need any other services other than you know food and also just promoting small businesses by listing their hours and their COVID-19 protocol and, and or restrictions. Um, but honestly, if I had never joined Unity, I don't think I would like just the way that I have. Um, Miss Miss Kelly and Miss June and Miss Asia and Miss Cindy have been so amazing and they've been like honorary mothers to me. I honestly don't know what I would do without them. They're just so amazing and honestly I uh, sorry <laughs> starting to tear up a little bit because I'm graduating this year so um, it's going to be very difficult being uh, in them, like you know right there <laughs> with me but I know that you know I carry them in my heart wherever I go and um, though we mostly like met virtually over the pandemic and everything they had they had been very like honestly supportive people in my life and I honestly even seeing their smiles over zoom even now we we don't usually meet um uh, in person as much as you know I would like but you know we have to keep still keep people safe and even though most of us have been vaccinated but honestly um I've been able to continue my race and reconciliation initiative through this program over zoom throughout the pandemic and also um, I've been able to have the opportunity to work on a uh, another youth-led uh, organization called the New York State Governor's Youth Council, where I've been able to put my input about policies that a lot of the youth within my generation are very passionate about, such as environmental justice and other social justice issues. So honestly, if I had never been that's very important to me and being a part of a group that really pushes for this sort of support because, you know, sometimes people kind of throw you at the wayside or use you as like a token. Whereas here, I really don't feel like a token. I feel like I'm doing things upon my own volition and through having such um, powerful, potent female support, it's just great to have such great role, role models. And honestly, I know that I'm gonna be able to, you know, keep this moving forward as I go on through my life and continue using the life skills that my advisors have been able to, you know, sort of push through me. So I'm very grateful for Brie, being a part of this Thank you. Program. We are so <laughs> thankful. And Brie has also been such an amazing role model for other younger folks in the, younger team leaders in the program. Um, 
they she has just really helped pave the way, held them accountable, and helped these projects come to fruition. One piece that is also really important is that we do have a family engagement piece. Um, and before the pandemic hit, we were really about to start this parent engagement cafe that was going to be in person and we would all meet. Um, and we really, again, had to quickly pivot. And so like Ms. June said, as part of a grant that she wrote, we were able to supply and deliver kits to our young people monthly and their families. And what an honor it is to be able to be in somebody's kitchen and living room with their families and getting to interact and cook together and we eat together. And I'm not, and I'm not so sure that that may go away. Um, there are parts of this pandemic that may stay in a hybrid model, and we are shifting to more in-person stuff now that New York State is opening up a little bit, but um, we are really excited about the future of Unity. That is really, uh, really very cool, and thank you, Brie, for sharing your story, and Kelly, for, uh, for sharing all of this about what Cornell has been, has been working on. I'd like to give folks an opportunity to ask questions at this point uh, for, at, for Cornell, but also for Oklahoma uh, State. Uh, so I'm gonna bring folks back up onto the screen so you can see their uh, smiling faces uh, if, if they're the person who responds to your question. So if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself or drop it in the chat and I'll be happy to interpret it for you if that's how you would prefer to I'd go. just like to chime in, Mark, and uh, thank Bree for all her kind words. <laughs> uh, she went to the prom this weekend and last weekend, and she was absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning. And we were so blessed to have part of our team supporting her and getting ready for the prom. And uh, she was just beautiful and we're so proud of her. So, so you all talked a little bit about how um, you you couldn't uh, you had to rely a little bit on on the youth having their own technology to communicate during uh, during this. Uh, and one of the concerns that um, that I faced as a as a youth as a youth worker as a youth practitioner is ensuring the safety of the staff as well as the the young person when you're when you have those kinds of communications directly from phone to phone. How did you maintain uh, safety of your of your program staff or, or, or ensure that, that all of the questions that parents might have about why you're communicating directly with their kids or, or not are being covered. And maybe Chantel, can you talk a little bit if, if you guys had that consideration? Yes, I was thinking about even back before all this happened in regards to communicating with students, I would, con we would I, I remember asking the parents, is it okay first and getting their, their permission. Um, and then thinking back to our most recent recruitment event, this was in person, the kids signed up first and then we contacted their parents to make sure that it was okay. So we always want to make sure we get permission or at least let the parents know, you know, we will be communicating with, with your child. And we ask what is the best way to communicate a lot of times too. Mm -hmm. What about at Cornell? What did you guys think about? I think we, we have our young people, our teen leaders and their families complete an application, uh, which is a teen leader application to be a part of the program where they kind of write an essay. The parents read through and sign a media release, uh, um, all kinds of releases. And that kind of allows them to recognize A, what the program is, it explains what it is. It talks about the communication that we will need to have. And it puts families and the teen leaders kind of in a place where they talk about and discuss and then turn in their applications. And that has really worked, proven to work well. Cool. We get student numbers and parent numbers in our application. Awesome. So there is a question in the chat uh, from Ellie McCann asking if she's, she says she's wondering if your family engagement pieces include anything about around parenting. Uh, so for a little bit of context, she mentions that they've begun working with Somali youth and will soon begin to work with parents on parenting and then we'll bring them all together. So, uh, well, uh, the member of our team who is with us today, Cindy Conway, is the parent family uh, coordinator for UNITY, and she is also a credentialed uh, family, uh, parent family instructor educator with Cornell with years of experience. And uh, so we 
do it subtly, subtly, I would say, but uh, Cindy is very uh, connected with the family. She follows up on things. If families do have questions or concerns or they're having trouble accessing resources in the community, whatever it is, Cindy is there. She, as I said, she has years of experience and uh, the follow through that Cindy has is, is outstanding. I would love, and quickly, uh, as well as our family engagement nights, within our family engagement night, we have our nutrition educators who are offering lessons to our family. So food safety, budgeting, um, cooking for your family, cooking healthily for your family. Um, and it's become kind of a wish list as to what families would like to learn more about. So that is kind of a piece of parenting, right? Um, is learning how to be healthy, budget and all of that kind of stuff. And our programming does focus on those family sessions. It is geared towards some parenting subtly as well. And it's particularly with this new shift with growth mindset and habits that definitely go applies to anybody living and breathing on earth. So we infuse that and talk and, um, you know, we encourage parents to implement those strategies as well with their, with their kiddos. Cannot kiddos use. <laughs> There's all kinds of names, aren't there? Yeah. Yeah, I don't get too bent out of shape when uh, the teens that I work with call me a, an old fogey. So you know, <laughs> it goes both ways. So uh, we have a couple more minutes before we go to um, the final session. And so I, I'll watch for another question or, or somebody to pop in. Uh, but while, while we're waiting, Bree, and I'll hold the silence, I'd like you to think a little bit about what was the one thing, if you had to name one thing, that you're taking away from your CIFAR experience during this pandemic, uh, a lesson that you would want other uh, uh, leaders, uh, you know, adult leaders, youth leaders to know that, that that really worked. What would that one thing be that you would you would think that they should they should come up, bring forward? So um, there's one uh, African proverb that my grandma always talks about all the time, and she states that it says if you want to go fast so being a leader is about um wait can you hear me no you keep the crush coming in and out okay can you hear me now or I can, yes, Bray. We can. Here, I'm going to turn my camera off. Perfect, that'll help. <laughs> so basically, um, one of the biggest things that I've learned through Unity is honestly that being a leader isn't just about how well you, you know, dominate a room or how big your voice, your own voice is within a room, but how well you facilitate and how well you bring others along with you and how you work well with other people's strengths and how you can also amplify the strengths of your um, team leaders and help them not to be, you know, insecure about things that really do not have an, an effect on how well they are able to perform. And, you know, it's not just about, you know, pushing yourself forward, but pushing others forward. So continuing to do that and continuing to be a positive agent of change and just being positive within your own people feel more comfortable, especially to all the emotional, like, troubles that a lot of people are with right now in terms of depression and anxiety, just continuing to be positive and just making sure that not only focus on your progress, but really taking, um, putting priority in the, in the progress of the people around you, so. That's some good advice, you know, to, to really, because one size doesn't fit all, you know, you have to think about um, what it is that the, that the individuals in your program need, uh, and the best ways to to do that and to support uh, to support them bringing their voice forward. All right, folks, it's three forty five in the Midwest, so that makes it four forty five on the East Coast. That means it's time for our closing session. So if you go back to the main room, I just will... like to thank everyone who came to our session and thank Bree and and Kelly and uh, Chantel. I uh, value everyone's uh, commitment to young people and. It makes me very happy to be part of this team. And thank you for all of the years, June, that you've been leading us in these things. We appreciate <laughs> it. So She's please, our foundation. 
<laughs> Thank you all. And bye we'll bye. see you in the main room. Bye-bye.